Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Hernan. I am a postdoc at Northern International University, and this is uh, work that I've been developing as a postdoc uh, with uh, uh, Andrew Paul Jones lab at FSU, and also with uh, the Kremlin lab at um, George Washington University. My supervisor is uh, Hilary Rankin Grissom, and we'd like to tell you all about how to deal with uh, polygenomic data at two different uh, time scales with two experimental data sets. Um, and I guess many of you are here, either you're my friend or you're my phylogenist. Hopefully it's both. <laughs> um, and usually when we're looking at phylogenies, there's many ways to prepare them and study them, and that's why we love them. Uh, I'm gonna show you a cartoon, and while it's in the room, please don't freak out, it's just a cartoon. Uh, imagine that you have, uh, you want us to make an apple phylogeny, or you have an apple phylogeny. Uh, or a file emoji phylogeny. And you want to compare it to maybe something completely different. For example, you want to compare an apple phylogeny to an orange phylogeny. Can you do that? They don't have the same taxa. They uh, are at very different uh, evolutionary scales. For example, the orange phylogeny is basically monoclots versus dicots. The apple phylogeny includes stuff at the family level or below. How can you compare them? You cannot run drugs and call businesses on that or any other metric that we have. The one thing they do have in common is edges and nodes, branch legs, and nodal support, hopefully. For example, the one on the right, the apple phylogeny, <coughs> has three nodes, but has some uh, statistical level of support. The one on the right has four nodes, and it also has some support. One is, let's say, maximum likelihood of bootstrapping, the other one is patient to steer probabilities. Um, Keith Parker and I came up with this idea of summarizing that information. You determine a threshold of support. For example, I am using for this talk 70% bootstrap support by Hillis and Bull in 1993. That's probably the lowest uh, nodal support that you would say it's, it makes biological sense. And what we do is divide the number of nodes that have that threshold divided by the total number of nodes. And for example, the material on the right, you have three nodes, the three highly supported. You get an index of one. The logic behind it is very similar to other normalizing indices that come from zero to one. The phylogeny on the right, the orange phylogeny, has only two or four nodes. So it means that it has a highly supported node index of, pop, of 0.5. So before you couldn't compare apples to oranges. Well, now you can. <laughs> what does this mean? Why is it useful? Especially when we have phylogenomic data. Well, I'm going to give you, like I said, two examples. The first one is the decapod tree of life. That includes everything that we love eating that comes from the skin, has a hard shell, but walks with big legs. And there are two big hypotheses. The first one is what we call the Natantia group that groups two types of shrimp. Prawns on one side, basically everything you throw in a barbecue, I call them barbecue shrimp. And the other one is a kind of typical shrimp, the ones that are very pretty you buy in an aquarium. And what Jones said is that they swim. The other big play includes true crabs like Sebastian, hermit crabs, uh, ghost shrimp, includes uh, crayfish, lobsters, and all kinds of lobsters, uh, especially rock lobsters and flipper lobsters. And all those crawl. And that's based on morphology. And as you can see, that's a really old hypothesis. And this is a really, really old uh, group. It's about uh, over 500 million years old. And doing phylogenomics at this scale is kind of complicated. Um, the other hypothesis is proposed in uh, 1963. It says basically that you have uh, barbecue shrimp. They're one group. They're called microbranchiata because their, their gills are completely separate. They're completely different. And the other group is pioclineata, which is basically they carry their babies on their legs. So. Uh, the hypothesis is very different and it's similar to the uh, conflict that we have with, or, 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 uh, or how we place, for example, um, in mammals, uh, aprotherian versus uh, sonarocrans and what is their relationship. It's something very similar to that problem. So I'm going to show you uh, the effort from the tree of life. This is the tree of life, 4072 taxa with five loci. This is a partitioned maximum likelihood concatenated tree. This is what my boss calls, this is her baby. 
She's not here, so I guess I won't get in too much trouble. But imagine that you look at your ring and you want to look at a nodal support. I coded uh, high support is black for gray, and below that threshold is red. When you plot it out on the tree, it looks like your baby has small pox. <laughs> and my, my boss just had a baby, and, I, um, and she's doing really well, so it's not a correlation there. Anybody has a guess on how many nodes are supported there? Any takers? 50? 60%? 50, so who has 70, 70, 70 nodes? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you calculate the same thing, if you can calculate an R, I put it in an R, it's the simplest thing on the planet, but it takes a millisecond, it's 0.66. So with this tiny index, you can know where you have to work in, and what we have to strive for. So in collaboration uh, with the AcroPower Lab, um, what we did was to get 170 taxa, and we were able to get hundreds of loss lines for, uh, for many of these plates in this group. And I'll just show you the decimal distribution of this index on the main plates that are colored on the tree. For example, for the barbecue shrimp, you can see that it's truly a normalized index, which is really not surprising. The index goes from zero to one. And the value is about here, the median. So as you can see, most of the gene trees, uh, they don't have absolute support. And it's the same case for every uh, typical shrimp. Those would be the, uh, the slipper lobsters. These are crayfish and frog lobsters. These are herb crabs, and these are true crabs. If we look at this all together, you can see that even though most of them are normal, the values of support of all those gene trees are between, uh, I would say, 0.3 to 0.7. And um, that is really to be able to start doing some steps. So for example, if we look at the distribution of this index compared to the locus length, and as we've heard, many talks say that the longer the locus we have, the most information we have. So should we strive for longer loss life? Yes or no? As you can see from the regression, all those regressions are statistically very, very significant, but the r square value is not really that high. It goes from 0.2 in the best case scenario, to 0.05. And obviously you can see that many of these genes, they have a lot of support even though they're very, very short. And this is gonna happen at these levels of diversification. Even shorter loci are very, very informative. And with this index, I would tell you, for example, Tammy was talking about uh, how can you incorporate some of these things, for example, if you want to co-estimate the species tree and the gene tree. <coughs> Maybe on Scarbies right now, you can only run 70 loss or 50 loss what well, I'll just say, do a tiny regression, super simple, and pick maybe these guys. I would certainly say, for that case, maybe you can skip on the ones at the bottom. Maybe they're not worth integrating. Of course, with summary-based methods, you can put them all together, it's actually a lot better. Um, you wanna see the biology, how they look like? So that is it. And you don't really need to look at the, uh, the bootstrap values on each tree. The trees were identical between concatenation and astral. What's interesting is what Scott Edwards had said in 2008. Concatenation overestimates the uh, nodal support in all the trees. As you can see from uh, a species tree method, all of them, even though in, in concatenation they're really high support, most of them, when you look at the HSN index in the species tree, is all of it is a lot lower. But the biologists are not looking too bad, right? Now, what happens if you want to integrate and look at the Decabot tree of life at this scale? Well, unfortunately, because it's very, very old, we're only able to pull 21 loci across those hundreds and hundreds of loci for each plate. However, the gain, if you remember, I mentioned that the concatenated tree of life decapod tree was 0.66 HSN index. Well, if you concatenate that with this 21 acropylo loci, you get a substantial gain. You gain 20% resolution. And with this tiny index, it was really easy to assess that. Now, if you run a species tree analysis with Astro, it's not looking that bad either. So it's 0.73. So even though uh, some of those notes in concatenation are probably inflated and they're not correct. We made uh, some gain. And now we know where we can concentrate our efforts. <coughs>
to try to solve this. This was the first pass, and I think that this is brand new data, so we can go back and do the bioinformatics and design some kits and get additional foresight, and it's really good. Now I'm going to move on to a very, very shallow scale, one that is dear to my heart. And it's woodpeckers. And how can you combine woodpeckers with Trent if it's not in a weird culinary way? Well, <laughs> it's because with this index you can. For example, this is the phylogeny on Melanerpes woodpeckers. These are the golden fronted, uh, red belly, and includes acorn woodpeckers. They're charismatic, everybody loves them. They do all sorts of interesting biological things. Well, this is the phylogeny that we're ready to submit with five loci, five Sanger sequence loci. And as you can see, the HSM index over here, time calibrated beautifully, but not even half percent of the nodes are well supported. So, with Alan and Emily, what I did was to probe a lot of loci at this problem. And it's the same. You look at the distribution, even though uh, most of the nodes maybe have 30% support, it's very similar to what you had seen before. So even though you're looking at 400 million years old versus 10 million years old, the support values are not that distant. You don't see like a bimodal distribution. It's all pretty contiguous and the confidence intervals of this distribution is all overlap. If you look at the relationship between length and the index, um, it is highly significant, but like I had said, the regression is not, really doesn't capture a lot of loss. However, uh, if you see the density of most of the sign for loss side, it's because they're super long compared to other uh, techniques. For example, you see these tend to be a lot shorter. The median value is 1300 base pairs. So if we had some simulations, like I did, uh, to get shorter loss side from these uh, trees, you can see that actually length does matter, at least at this scale. So again, my suggestion would be, if you're gonna sample uh, trees and you wanna estimate multicolor species trees with, at the same time, species tree and gene tree, maybe it'll be a good idea to sample from this side and try to go to longer well side if possible. Or maybe get uh, high sync 3000 that can get you a longer context so you can get a longer, uh, longer genes. You wanna see the phylogeny of the pecker? With all the set one? That's what happens. You get almost a, per a perfect score. It doesn't matter if it's contamination or if it's a uh, real species tree. And actually, the species tree did better than contamination. Um, so, I am very happy, and I hope I convince you that by just coding this thing in R, and if you want it, I can send you the code. It's two lines of code, it's super simple. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank you for coming here. The take home message is. The HSN index helps you normalize and convert any tree you want. Uh, deeper scales, shorter loss side, they still have a lot of information, but at shorter scales, longer loss side seem to make uh, the difference. So I'd like to thank a lot of collaborators, the Open Tree of Life, uh, the Deep End Consortium that is paying my salary, funding from FIU, my former labs in Minnesota, uh, the photographers that allow me to use their pictures, Disney for not seeing me, for using their pictures. Collections and Carolyn Lisa that did a lot of blog work with me in Minnesota to get this data to you. Mm -hmm. And of course, all the collections that allow me to use their tissues to get the Woodpecker data. And with that, I would take any questions you would have.